It is absolutely beyond amazing. I cannot believe I get to podcast interview Marco Vujicic, who's the chief economist at the American Dental Association. Check out this guy's credentials. He's responsible for overseeing all of the Dental Association's policy research activities. Prior to joining the American Dental Association, he was senior economist with the World Bank in Washington, D.C., where he directed the Global Health Workforce Policy Program. He was also a health economist with the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. He is a visiting assistant professor at Tufts University in Boston. He obtained his PhD in economics from the University of British Columbia and a bachelor's degree in business from McGill University in Montreal. I don't think I've ever had anybody this qualified and this intelligent on my podcast ever before. I'm a huge fan of your work, your YouTube videos. Um, where do you want to start on this? Um, so I'm just going to ask you my first question. What does dentistry look like to do, to do today to you? How is the profession doing? Yeah, so first, let me just say thanks for having me on, Howard. You obviously have a big footprint in this area, and it's a real pleasure to kind of share some thoughts with you and your viewers and listeners, and congrats on the work you're doing. Look, I'm a, I'm a Canadian, as we were talking about earlier, um, and one, one of the things I talk about is dentistry's Wayne Gretzky moment. Um, and what that means is obviously Wayne Gretzky was one of my boyhood heroes and he talks about skating to where the puck is going to be versus where it is today. So, I mean, we'll, we'll get into this, but my big opening punchline is we are at such a critical moment of reform uh, in healthcare and in dental care. Um, I call it a once in a century moment, a kind of Geis moment. Um, where I see the convergence of a lot of factors radically changing the dental care landscape. I couldn't agree with you more. Let's jump into them. So I, I kind of focus on five that I think are the most important. And let's talk about these. And I'd like to hear you know, your thoughts too. I mean, people are like, well, I don't think that's important. What about this issue? But let me go through those. Um, the big game changer number one is what I call a shift to the value agenda. And what that means is healthcare in the US and dental care is included in this, um, is transforming to a world where we're gonna focus much more on outcomes, value, cost effectiveness, versus volume and paying people for procedures. Uh, and this is really a, 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 an uncomfortable shift, I would say, for clinicians. Um, so for example, um, both public and private payers are undertaking a lot of reforms to reward clinicians for getting people healthy and not just paying for procedures. Um, we see some pretty ambitious targets, both in the public and private sector. Um, with that said, I feel dental care is a little bit lagging in this area, but I want to emphasize that I'm convinced that this movement will come to dentistry. I'm convinced it will take much longer. This is one of my 20 year horizon type of game changers. And we can talk about why in a second. Um, but that is my number one, basically a shift away from volume to value, um, including shifting payment systems for providers a little bit away from just paying people on volume like fee for service and rewarding clinicians and dental care providers for keeping people healthy. Right? Um, the second big one is related to this. I call it consumerism. Um, you know, a lot of us shop for things in very different ways than 20 years ago. Obviously technology has enabled a lot of that. But this now is coming to healthcare, and, and it's not me. There are people that are a lot smarter than me that basically, you know, if you look at healthcare and, and education, these are two sectors, in my view, that haven't really gone through this data revolution and consumerism movement, but, they're, but healthcare is about to. So, what does this mean? Uh, over half of millennials today go online and look for cost and quality information before they even pick up the phone or increasingly text and email. 
to try to make an appointment with a healthcare provider. So that's radically different. We're talking about people that are online looking at quality scores, cost information, and doing a lot more comparisons. And what, what are you now, calling it, number two? What's his title, number two? That's consumerism. Consumerism, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, this kind of goes against the grain, especially when I talk to kind of dentists who are more seasoned in the later stages of the career, um, who think, well, no, you know, my patients will do anything to keep me as their provider, and they will travel long distances, and they don't really shop and, and around. I mean, that's radically changing. I mean, that certainly is true of, of the older cohorts of patients. But again, I gave the example of millennials. I don't see that as sustainable. Um, so again, I'm not a clinician. As you know, I'm a numbers guy. But to me, there are implications for, for dental practices on getting an online presence, being transparent with cost and quality and outcomes, um, which, you know, we'll come back to. It's like, you know, there is this whole thing. What do you mean by outcomes in dental care? Um, but let's revisit that. The, the third big game changer is a big increase in collaboration across different professions. Um, you know, it, it's very clear in my view that in the next decade, a lot of walls and silos are going to be broken down in healthcare. This is everything from, you know, having to duplicate tests when you go to your GP versus your specialist people released from hospitals with no kind of follow-up, home care, et cetera. All that is going to start changing uh, because of this emphasis on value, right? So, for example, it's going to make a lot more sense to have some type of patient coach uh, that can coordinate people's primary care, specialty care, uh, make sure people are taking their meds. There's a lot of innovation happening here to get kind of care centered around the consumer or the patient. And this obviously means that you have to get different clinicians talking to each other, uh, especially in a world where, as I said in my first game changer, the value movement. Think about a world, Howard, where, where let's say a hospital is paid uh, based on the outcomes of people after they get hip surgery, right? So it's no longer that everybody, you know, that, that, that the facilities paid for the OR time, the anesthesia, the device, et cetera. Hospitals now, at least in Medicare, are basically on the hook for 30 days after discharge, after joint replacement. Um, if someone's readmitted, you don't get to charge more. You don't get to submit more claims, right? So what does, that, what does that make people do? It makes people think really differently. It's, make, it's making sure that I can give people tools at home that they need uh, to get well, to do their physio, to take their meds. If there's transportation challenges, to help them get to their primary care provider for follow-up, et cetera. Yeah? Now, I'm not sure where dentistry fits in in all this. I mean, there is a pretty big wall traditionally, I'd say for the last 50, 60 years, between oral care and the rest of the healthcare system. Um, I do feel, though, that there are going to be a lot more opportunities opening up for oral care providers, dentists, and others to actually be part of this multidisciplinary movement. And here's why. Think about now a group of diabetics and think about their endocrinologist or their primary care providers being rewarded based on whether these diabetics have proper blood glucose under control. Now, so that's different, right? I'm, I'm no longer kind of paid for amputations only. I'm actually incentivized to keep people well and out of hospital. Yeah? Now, if I'm clever and I believe that periodontal health or mouth health can contribute to people's wellness, I'm going to be interested in engaging dental care providers with, for example, this diabetic population. And we have pretty good research that we did and others did that showed you can actually reduce medical care costs among diabetics, for example, if they have enhanced access to oral care. So I think there's going to be opportunities presented to oral care providers. Um, However, whether they want to engage in that and be part of multidisciplinary teams and kind of join this outcomes movement, um, you know, you probably know a lot more about the ground level, well, you do, than me. Um, you know, that's to be determined. 
but I definitely do see a generational change or a shift or a difference. Uh, for example, I feel younger dentists are much more open to these collaborative opportunities than, let's say, kind of latter stage, latter career dentists. Um, the fourth one is what I call shifting demand patterns. And, and this is kind of, I mean, again, you could look at this as an opportunity or some sobering news, depending on where you sit. Um, but here's what I see happening on the demand side, Howard, under current trends. Um, we know that a lot more children have been going to the dentist in America. If I look at a decades-long trend, it's, there have been remarkable increases in utilization of dental care among children. Most of this has been lower income and middle income children, but the trends are clear. 49 out of 50 states are seeing more and more children visiting the dentist. This is good. Um, the trends on the adult side are very different. We've seen now for since the early 2000s a pretty steady decline in the percent of working age adults who have a dental visit within the year. Now interestingly this crosses the income spectrum. In other words, low income adults, middle income adults, and high income adults are visiting the dentist less and less. Adults with no form of dental coverage and adults with private dental coverage have both been seeing the dentist less and less. So I just want to emphasize that there has been a pretty long-term systematic trend in increasing use among kids, declining use among adults, including upper income adults. Um, and seniors, there's not much action. It's kind of flat. Can you give us some data points on when the adults peaked and, and where, what it's down to? Yeah, the, the, um, the peak was in 2003 in terms of utilization. Um, we'll put the chart up in a sec with the actual data points. Uh, it's been a pretty slow decline since then. Um, with children, it's just been up and up and up. And you know, every year we release the report and the title is the same, more kids than ever visiting the dentist because uh, we keep kind of breaking records. Um, but you know, to, to get to your point, the main thing is this, this decline in adult dental care use to me is not driven by uh, recent uh, economic cycles. There's something much bigger at play. This is not just kind of the recession lingering, et cetera. There's been much more and we can talk about that. Uh, but if I look at the crystal ball in terms of utilization, um, for, for various factors, um, a big part being how the Affordable Care Act handled dental care, uh, which I'd like to elaborate on. But let me give you the punchline. The punchline to me is I don't see a major shift in this trend for adults um, in the next five years, for example. Um, kind of the, the drivers of this decline have been three big ones. One is just general stagnation in household incomes among the middle class. Um, and again, we can talk about whether that's going to radically change. I don't think so. But that's nothing to do with them, right? That's just middle income, income, middle, middle income households have not seen any dramatic at all uh, increases in their, in their income levels, in, in household income levels. The second is a slow erosion of dental insurance among adults. That takes two forms. Fewer adults have private dental coverage and the amount of care that a typical private dental plan can pay for um, or can enable uh, has, has declined because of things like flat annual maxes and more uh, increased coinsurance rates, etc. The third is demographic shifts by ethnicity. Um, Basically, a larger share of the population is Hispanic, uh, and all else equal, uh, Hispanics use dental care at a lower rate than non-Hispanics when I control for education, income level, etc. So those three factors in research we've done, we've kind of shown, are a big driver of what's been happening uh, to to the to dental care utilization. Now, interestingly, you know, a lot of people ask, well, what if you know, is the population healthier? Are needs going down? Um, everybody I talk to says this and believes it, from researchers to clinicians to policymakers. 
myself as a discipline researcher, I haven't seen good data that measures oral health outcomes in a consistent way over long periods of time. Now I buy it. Your typical adult mouth at 30 years old today is probably healthier than it was a generation ago, right, for a typical 30-year-old. Um, but just the, the data sources we look at don't give us a real hard data point we can do. Now, shifting gears, I was saying I don't see this reversal happening anytime soon in what's been happening with adults. The one caveat is with low-income adults on Medicaid. And this is important for the, for the audience to understand. I do foresee a pretty big uptick in many states in demand for dental care among low-income adults. Part of this is largely driven by this thing called Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act. So um, a significant chunk of states, I believe 30 at the last count, have basically expanded Medicaid eligibility, which means more adults who had no form of health insurance pre-ACA are now in public coverage via Medicaid. Now, those are some pretty big increases in many states. Like in Colorado, we're talking about doubling the number of adults on Medicaid. Now, if you happen to be in a state that has a dental benefit for adults within Medicaid, you're going to basically see a bunch of adults coming into Medicaid. They wake up. They have health insurance. They also have dental coverage. And they didn't have it yesterday. Now, as as Participants, you know, as dentists participating in Medicaid know, a lot of these states have pretty backwards policies and, you know, some services are covered, some are not. Reimbursement's typically really low. But look, patients don't know and don't care. They, they see, okay, today, you know, I have this new benefit, I want to use it, I haven't been to the dentist in years, it says here I have dental. They don't know anything about the limits or anything like that, about the constraints. Um, they're going to be looking for dental care. Now, we've estimated this could be about an 8.3 million increase in the number of adults who wake up with public dental insurance by Medicaid. So some states, you know, are going to see, I call it a boom, in kind of demand for dental care among low-income adults. So if you're in that space or considering that space, I do see growth there. Uh, the senior population as well is definitely what I would call a boom coming. As you know, we have many, many more seniors, um, many more people entering retirement age um, every day in the U.S. Uh, this is a cohort that tends to value dental care, uh, have higher loyalty to their dentist than younger generations today. Um, have a lot of dental needs that need maintaining, restorative work that needs updating. This is not like the fluoride generation, uh, like you and I, Howard. Um, uh, but, but basically, this is a generation that I feel is going to have a spike in demand for dental care. Um, but then the boomers, you know, within 15, 20 years, that generation kind of, uh, you know, dies out, as a statistician would say. So to summarize, what I see as trends in the near term are increased demand for dental care among kids, increased demand for dental care among seniors, a huge increase in demand for dental care among low-income adults, but continued stagnation in kind of middle to upper income adults with private coverage who get their coverage through their employer. That kind of bread and butter market I don't see rebounding unless something uh, significant is done. Um, and we can talk about what that may be. Uh, the last one, the big force number five, uh, is what I call, uh, I call it big data, the big data revolution. Um, so again, you know, the smartphone and things like wearable devices and Fitbit have started and I believe continue and will continue to uh, revolutionize how people interact with healthcare providers. Um, well, you know, what does that mean? You, know, you can now you know, you can record your vital signs, you can share and communicate with clinicians via text and, and apps, etc. Um, you know, with dentistry, a couple things that I think are innovative and illustrate what I mean by big data revolution are number one, the smart toothbrush, right? So here's a device that basically can monitor my brushing behavior 
as a patient or as a consumer, right? And it can give this information to my clinicians and my dentists. Um, that fundamentally is a tool that's going to help me behave better. Um, the idea of these devices is that they make it easy for you to do the right things, etc. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff coming on the market. There's a mouth guards with sensors on it. So, for example, with bruxism, you can monitor during sleep and during the night what's going on in your mouth. Um, I'm convinced somebody is going to come up with a smart dental floss soon. Uh, at minimum, it'll know how much is used. Uh, the Cadillac version will have some way of measuring kind of bacteria counts or something like that or assessing your periodontal health. Um, now, why is this important? This is important because it's changing the relationship between patients and clinicians. Yeah? The, the, kind of the days of me phoning a provider, asking for my x-rays, taking that to my specialist, me phoning people to book appointments, uh, you know, that's slowly going away. I mean, you know, I'm convinced somebody's going to come up with some type of easy way to book dental appointments automatically, to let me search for dentists in my area that accept my coverage, have open appointment spots. Um, electronic records are going to become much more um, prominent and easy and things like smart toothbrushes that allow providers to have better data on my behavior I think are going to become really really important now here's why let's go back to let's say my dentist is rewarded in some way I don't know let's say two percent or five percent of the reimbursement to my dentist is on keeping me cavity free or or basically maintaining my medium periodontal disease risk at medium and not letting it go to high or base or something like taking me from a moderately severe risk of caries down to a moderate risk for caries something like this related to outcomes you know what is my dentist going to start looking for my dentist well pr should be looking for ways to say okay marco Part of your oral health obviously happens in our office, but a large part happens in your home, your bathroom, at the dinner table, what you're doing with your mouth, etc. And so, you know, let's figure out ways to make it easy for you to remember to floss or to easy ways for you to kind of remember to brush and let's incentivize you. So, for example, Howard, there's a new uh, company that recently launched called Beam. Uh, and what they basically did is they partnered, uh, they, they have a dental plan and they have basically a smart brush, an app on your phone. They every three months send you supplies to your front door. So it makes it easy. I don't even have to go to the drugstore to buy heads and, and, and toothpaste, etc. They, they make it easy for me. And they basically they give patients points. Are you saying uh, beep, B E E B? Beam, as oh, in beam. laser. Yeah, beam. Okay, like beam. Just, just beam. dot com. Uh, I don't. I don't know exactly what the site is. Okay. Um, but I will. I will. I will get that to you. Um, and anyway, they basically let you accumulate points, and kind of the the higher your preventive uh, oral hygiene adherence, the more kind of points you earn. And those points actually can be used to help reduce copays for restorative care. So they're kind of putting the patient on the hook a little bit here, saying that kind of, you know, if your behavior is more positive, you actually have skin in the game. Because obviously this risk cannot all be on providers. I mean, nobody wants that and nobody feels that sound. It needs to be shared um, with the patient as well. So that's one example, I think, of a pretty innovative technology uh, and a company that's kind of making it easier for consumers to do the right thing, getting consumer skin in the game, and letting the dentists that participate in this plan have their data uh, on my oral health. So those are my five big ones, um, game changers. So the value agenda, consumerism, increased collaboration, shifting demand patterns, and the big data revolution. Um, one of the, one of the uh, townies asked on Dental Town, or is this happening in Canada too with adults seeing the dentist less, do you know, by any chance? Yeah, the colleagues I speak with up there, they are seeing very similar trends. Um, and so, you know, and also with, with Canada, you know, 
just to clarify that the dental care system is organized pretty similar to here in the U.S. Um, it's not part of the public insurance program. Do you um, find it personally morally confusing for yourself to be a fan of hockey and work for the American Dental Association when the average hockey player is missing half of his front teeth? <laughs> I haven't thought of it that way, but but perhaps. Yeah. It's so funny. Whenever they pan to the bench of the Phoenix Coyotes, I mean, they all have their partials out. There's there's hardly any teeth in the front line. Um, you know, yeah. I want I want I want to step back. Um, since you're, I mean, I I'm I'm seriously your biggest fan. I, I I I've been. I can't believe the American Dental Association was able to get you from the World Health Organization in Geneva. But you know, when you go to Singapore, there's no dental insurance, and then you cross the ocean into Tokyo, there is. What, what do you as an economist think? I mean, I, I get health insurance for medicine because you can be struck down with cancer or these rare diseases that, that you there's no way you can afford. But I just want to ask you your own personal value as an economist because, you know, dental decay is a behavioral deal. You're drinking Coke and Pepsi and brushing your teeth with honey and Mountain Dew, and then the government or your employer is supposed to subsidize your dental insurance. When I talk, when I lecture in... Singapore and China, I mean, that they don't even get, I mean, Chinese dentists are like, well, why would your boss or your president or government subsidize you to have a cavity when you're the one that drank Coca-Cola and didn't brush your teeth? So they don't get it in Singapore and China, yet they have it in Japan. All of that's in Asia. As an economist, do you even think there should be, do you, do you think employers and government should be subsidizing a behavioral disease? Yeah, that's a real. That's a really good question. So, in a sense, what is the rationale, let's say, for dental insurance? So, you raise some really good points in there, Howard. I want to kind of split this up and have a little bit of discussion on it, right? Um, so, you know, the idea of should you cover something that is preventable, right, through an insurance program is an important question. Now look, I'm not a clinician, so I don't know how much of the dental disease is actually fully preventable versus there, you know, you could be brushing and flossing and doing all the right things, but you still have decay or you still have oral conditions, right? And remember, when I talk about oral health, I'm not just talking about cavities. Like I think we have a very, very narrow view. I say we as a profession, even though I'm not a dentist. I feel we have an extremely narrow view of oral health. I mean, me as a consumer, I've been, I've been cavity free for years and years. I don't think I have optimal oral health. I have some discomfort when I chew, I have bruxism, I have old restorations that I'm told are impeding some issues, um, I have comfort issues, etc. So to me, it's, it, we shouldn't just think of oral health as disease. So with that said, I think we need, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't know how much of oral health conditions, let's say, not just disease, but conditions, uh, are fully preventable behavioral. Ortho, I would say, is not, right? That's, as I understand it, that's genetic and it has to do with, you know, physiology, etc. You can be doing all the right things, but if you have conditions that require orthodontia so you can you know, function better, chew, speak, smile better. I mean, that's not something that, that should, that should be insured in my view. Now, um, you know, so, so let, you know, I'm going to just say some of this is preventable and some probably isn't. The disease side is certainly a lot more preventable, but that, you know, we, we don't, we don't not pay for lung transplants for smokers. Right? We don't make diabetics say, okay, well, look, you're not exercising, you're eating all the wrong food, um, you're smoking, you're drinking, you're sitting on the couch, and now you're asking, you know, the government or some insurer to pay for your, you know, uh, you know, your meds or your, you know, whatever, you know, your, 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 your diabetes control intervention. So, you know, I, I think that's a bit of a, you know, we don't hold that lens up on medicine. You know, I don't think we should hold it up that way on, on oral care. Um, so that, that's, that's one issue. A second thing you raised um, was the, the idea of subsidies. And I think this is important for, I guess, non-economists to, to understand. And Well, I'm not going to say non, for, for everyone to understand, um, is insurance isn't this free thing people get from their employer. Right. 
What insurance does is that it pools money and it pools risks and it subsidizes across people. So insurance is not free from your employer. Like you're basically paying through it through lower wages. I mean, that's what the economic studies have found. So you got to understand, you know, Medicare is not a free thing to 65 and olders in the U.S. I mean, you pay in premiums and part of it's funded through general taxation, etc. But there's contributions and the idea is, you know, certain people pay more than they consume and, and part of that is with income and part of that whether you're, you know, the healthy and wealthy subsidize the sick and poor. Like that, that's... That's what a society decides, and that's the value judgment it needs to it needs to have. So it's not like somebody's paying for my misbehavior, right? Um, I do want to say though, I firmly believe the current dental insurance model is pretty broken. Um, it's pretty broken, in the sense that our research has found that even adults with private coverage have serious affordability challenges for dental care that they need. Now, your viewers see this every day in their offices, right? It's like, well, you need X, Y, Z. And then, you know, me as a patient, I'm like, well, great, what does my plan pay for? And the dentist tells me, well, it pays for basically up to $1,200, but 50% is me, right? You have all these arrangements where crowns, you know, why is a crown funded at 50%? even if I'm doing all the right things and I have some issue that requires a crown. You know, that's something as a consumer I don't understand. Anyways, because of a lot of these provisions, um, in insurance and dental does not give anywhere close to the kind of financial protection, as we call it as economists, than typical metal medical insurance coverage. Uh, this model may have been fine 50 years ago or 20 years ago when it, it could pay for a lot more dental care than it does today in 2016. Um, but just to give you an example, you know, we just released a report where we found that, you know, a typical child and a typical adult with private dental insurance, the payments for premiums, copays, and coinsurance, if you add all that up, that actually exceeds the market value of dental care consumed. So that basically is saying, well, for the vast majority of beneficiaries, kind of the total financial outlays on premiums, copays, and coinsurance exceeds if you were to just go and consume that care and pay for it out of pocket. That doesn't mean we should, in my view, it doesn't mean we should do away with insurance. It means we should revisit this and make this model actually pay for the care people need. Now, you know, you raise a good point about a lot of my oral health is on my behavior, right? So I would start including this, what I call patient skin in the game. You know, I, I think insurance benefits should incorporate some type of, you know, patient behavior metrics, right? And now that hasn't been really been possible up until today with things like smart toothbrushes, right? Like, you know, with, with health insurance, you know, again, a lot of this has been reduced because of the Affordable Care Act, but, you know, there are incentives for things like gym memberships. And, you know, if you, if you have a gym membership, that potentially impacts your premium. And if you're a smoker versus non-smoker, you know, there are these kind of kickers that basically reward patients for healthy behavior. So... You know, we shouldn't just raise our hands and say, oh, well, all this is preventable and it's all in the consumer and walk away. I mean, that's not how healthcare is going. I mean, it's going to basically covering more things, putting the patients on the hook more through new technologies that help monitor behavior, etc. cetera. Um, and it's, you know, to me, again, what we're seeing, at least in these first few years of the Affordable Care Act is, there is a lot more financial protection. There are lower costs for consumers and kind of, quote unquote, it's working uh, the way Congress intended. But dental, you know, dental's still lagging on this. Um, so again, I'm not a believer that, you know, I firmly believe if we were to start from scratch and design a dental insurance plan that it, you know, addresses the weaknesses of the Byzantine model of, of the last 30, 40 years, we could make it really work so it's patient and doctor friendly. Interesting. I want to ask you a macroeconomic question because, like I say, you you were a senior economist at the World Bank. Uh, I mean, uh, in Washington D.C., um, 
you were with the World Health Organization. It seems like, uh, so in America, in 1935, Roosevelt said, you know, the, the people wanted four things. Uh, when they got injured on the job, they wanted workers' comp. He made that a federal law. Uh, when, when they're done laying the railroad track, instead of just firing you and leaving you out in the middle of Utah, uh, they had to give you unemployment insurance so, you know, you could find new work. Uh, when you're too old to work, instead of getting fired and, and uh, being a beggar, they gave you old age insurance, which turned into Social Security. But he tried to get health insurance like 20 other countries have. Like you lived in Canada, you were in Switzerland, they all have universal health insurance. But he couldn't get it done. Then wrote, then then Kennedy came in and in 61, and he got it for um, uh, Universal for the old Medicare and started the state Medicaid. And then Obama, the next populist, came and he tried to get Affordable Health Care Act. Um, what is your prediction? Do you think do you think in a in down the road America will have universal health insurance? Do you, do you think it's just a matter of time? It seems like they're just ch- prying the door open, open, open. Do you, do you think that's where the United States is headed? Yeah. So I think it's, there's there's an A and B to that question. So universal coverage, kind of the ACA has a mandate, right? I mean, we can say that part has been put in. Yeah, there are some exceptions, but I think what you're getting at is, will there be a single payer? Uh, like, a, like Medicare, right? Medicare is a large single payer for the 65 plus population. Um, I, I, you know, well, you know, you know, Hillary Clinton has made it clear, for example, that part of her platform would be to offer a public option, right? So that would be, to me, a small step that may lead to single payer. Um, you know, Donald Trump and, and his kind of health care platform has said stuff that's the opposite, right? It's more repeal Obamacare and you know, replace it with something, again, in my view, that's pretty vague. Uh, but but look, I mean, if I, I'm I'm not sure that the single payer is imminent in the U.S. I mean, I think Obamacare made some compromises that you know assured politically it was sellable. Um, there was the public option in there in the early stages; it got pulled out. I think to me, what what will be interesting if a public option does become available how popular it becomes because in theory both in theory howard and if you look at the whole oecd experience right large public payers tend to have a lot of advantages in terms of keeping costs down um you know basically purchasing power that kind of thing um and they they don't tend to have all these scary consequences that are often put forth like you know I mean, you can start from the absurd, like death panels, to, oh, no physicians or dentists will participate in these programs, etc. I mean, that's just not true, right? Um, so, I don't know. I hesitate to, to, to prognosticate, or if that's the right word, um, to, to predict that, uh, that a single payer is imminent. Um, I, I, I definitely, and if you see what's happening comparing 2016 to the dental insurance in the marketplaces in 17. It looks like we are going to see a narrowing of choice, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like competition does that. It says, you know, the the insurers that can get access at the lower cost should dominate the insurers that don't have good access at heart uh, at the same type of cost. Um, So we do potentially... Are are you referring to Aetna pulling out of Affordable Health Act? That's the story in the news, but I mean, if you look at the latest report across all states that ASPE did, one of the government agencies, I mean, you know, we saw increased competition the first couple of years, and in 17, we're looking at the first time to see kind of decreased choice for consumers. Again, as an economist and somebody who knows a lot about the OECD experience, you know, it's heresy in America to say this, but I mean, less choice is not necessarily bad if the stuff that's getting dropped is the stuff anyway that's kind of inferior product, right? Um, so again, my take is that, that this narrowing of options is not necessarily bad uh, to consumers. Um, I don't think single payer is imminent. I do think this election matters potentially for that. Um, but, but, you know, the, the move to more people covered by insurance definitely is on its way. I mean, the, the ACA was kind of perhaps one of the last uh, uh, kind of, as you said, big picture pushes for that. I am. Um, as an economist, what 
what macroeconomic uh, chart do you like to follow that you think is best at predicting where the economy is going uh, and getting growing, flattening, or contracting? What is it? Consumer confidence interval. What What do you think is the most forward-looking predictor of where the U.S. economy will be? Yeah, that part, I, I, I'm a consumer of those reports. I mean, I don't, you know, I, we look at things like, uh, you know, obviously GDP and even for the dental sector that is linked. You know, we recently put out, uh, if, if any of your viewers want to check it out, we, we did a very nice analysis saying what predicts health spend or dental care spending, basically what predicts the size of the dental economy. And obviously income, GDP was one of those. Uh, you know, all that stuff about consumer confidence, you're totally right. Um, you know, that obviously has an impact both on spending and dental care. Um, we look a lot at what's happening with dental insurance coverage rates. I mean, I've identified a lot of shortcomings in coverage, uh, but people with coverage are more likely to visit the dentist than people without. So we look at kind of surveys on what the percent of firms that are offering dental benefits. Uh, that's a kind of a good indicator um, on what's happening there. Um, and, and that's basically it. But I mean, Howard, you, you've kind of hit I, I, I know how to make you famous. You know how to, I can make you famous? Let's hear it. <laughs> well, see, you're, you're, you're a real economist. You have a PhD. I just have an MBA from Arizona State University. But when I was at ASU, I, I've been a dentist for 29 years. And I think what I think, that you, I think you should start the Vujicic Economic Indicator and, and take all the big, I mean, Delta does, you know, what, 20% of all the dental insurance claims, something like that. Um, and just track first molar, just one, two, number three. Did you decide to save it with a root canal buildup and crown and extract it? Because 29 years of looking back as a dentist, before all those bubbles, I was always shocked that year that, wow, you're an engineer at Intel and you're going to pull your molar? I mean, that's just crazy. And, and I think that all these individual Americans are all seeing what their future looks like personally. And how do you measure that thought? And I think the thought is, are you going to invest money in saving a body part or are you going to amputate it? When you're going to amputate it, you do not have a bright future. And I think if you started the first molar index and tracked what is the percent that individuals decide to save with a root canal building crown, which is a $2,500 investment, or just extract, I think that could be the most predictive variable in where this economy is going. So just, I want you to think about that. You're the only guy who could pull it off. You could you could get all that Delta data. That's, that, well, no. Uh, you know, frankly, we, we've been trying to get some data on the insurance market in different states. It's, it's actually been quite challenging. Uh, like insurer concentration and stuff. Like, you know, market share. Well, the JOE, the JOE just published a very neat um, article, which when you said big data, I thought you were going to go into evidence-based uh, care because... But they just took insurance data and they said, okay, when a general dentist has a molar root canal and an endodontist has a root canal, they, they have data to track, you know, yeah. the, how, and at five years, the endodontist had a 5% higher success rate. Well, that 5% is one out of 20. I mean, as a consumer, I mean, you get 20 teeth fixed, one extra one is saved. I mean, I think the endodontist should be all putting this on billboards above their office that we have a 5% higher success rate. Do you, so that's why... And you're you're absolutely correct. Uh, I could probably have, get dinner with Putin three times before I could get dinner with anybody uh, from Delta. I mean, Delta is just a, and I get it because uh, I, every time a dentist sends him a letter, it has profanity in it. I mean, I've gone, you know, I've, I've met some, I've met my local Delta homies, and I mean, they show me the letters, Dennis. I mean, these are dental offices. They've sent fifty to hundred thousand dollars of checks in for twenty years. They've only heard from them three times, and every three times. They're saying just the rudest, most offensive things. I mean, so Delta has been bitten by so many crazy dentists for so many decades that they just shut the door if they see you coming. But I do think that um, they're sitting on enough insurance data to really show, like, what well, does last longer, a composite tooth-colored filling or a metal filling. Now, real dentists like me know that if you go to KFC and you ask them what lasts longer, the tooth-colored plastic fork or the metal fork for my kitchen – you know, the guy that's living behind the dumpster at KFC will say the silver filling will last twice as long as the white plastic fork. But you have a hard time getting dentists to understand that because they just want to believe 
that their cosmetic dentistry lasts longer. But so I want you to start that voodoo sick indicator. I want you to start <laughs> tracking. Oh, first. I mean, I, you know, it sounds like you're you're the you're better place to, to start that. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll make a lot of money if you do. But look, I want to I want to bring out a point. You know, again, I'm not a clinician, but this issue of the extraction, the anecdote you gave, right? Um, extraction versus uh, endodontic procedure to retain the tooth, right? I mean, again, I I, I hesitate. I we have sometimes a knee jerk reaction to blame the patient. And my question is, why does the plan, why does the insurance plan entail such different out-of-pocket costs to the consumer for those procedures? Like, why is it that a root canal is, whatever it is, give me a number, 400 out-of-pocket for me, plus the buildup in the crown, I don't know, versus $30 out-of-pocket? I mean, that to me is preposterous. Why would you incentivize amputation versus retaining. Can I, can I tell you about my first job in Phoenix, Arizona? Uh, so I got out May 11, 87. And my office didn't get open till September 21. So four months I worked in a low income clinic and it was Medicaid. And they paid, um, mom's copayment was uh, $20 for the uh, pediatric child's filling. And the copayment was $15 for the extraction. And this is on permanent teeth. So every single mom would look at me and say, well, it's cheaper to pull it. And I'd say, yeah, but, but then your kid is, doesn't have that tooth. And I always thought to myself, why couldn't Arizona Medicaid just make it, if they made it $5 more expensive to save it, I mean, to pull it, then every mother in Arizona would have saved the damn tooth. And I'm just like, this is insane. I mean, so I, that, I did that for four months. That's the, that to me is the key question, Art. And when I talk about, and I have a forthcoming piece called that's going to come out called rethinking dental insurance, right? And one of the things I call for is that plans should start paying for oral health and not what procedures are covered, which are not, what's the annual limit, what's the copay and all this, right? So let's suppose that, you know, an, an insurance plan pays $900 to get you back to mouth function, right? And let's say we have some way of, like in medicine, things called diagnosis-related groups, right? So you do an exam, you do a risk assessment, you say, here's your condition, here's a bundle of payments that are actuarial fair based on the clinical evidence, right? And reasonable rates, reasonable payment to get you back to some moderate, doable, or very good level of, of mouth function, right? And then you let the clinicians do their clinicians work. You talk to the patient, you say, we can do this or this, we can do this or this, and here's kind of the impact on you. I mean, that'd be different, right? If if clinicians, if dentists were paid an equal sum of money for, you know, extractions versus implants or root canals and all that, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I really feel that this checklist of procedures that I don't know where they come from. Again, I'm just an observer. I'm not a scientist. And, you know, arbitrary maximum annual dollar amounts. I mean, that's got to be so frustrating for patients and clinicians as well. So anyway, we can do better. My point is, yeah. you know, groups like the American Dental Association, other patient advocacy groups, I really feel it's high time we should start rethinking this and start really you know, innovating and coming up with a new model that's patient and dentist friendly. So I, uh, you said earlier that you uh, don't know if you have optimum oral health, but you said you have um, grinding of your teeth, bruxism. And you know what causes that? It's that, that ring on your finger. Oh, why? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so see, I can, I can cure you. I won't even charge you for that. You know, that, that ring, is it, is it the wife or the kids? Which one is it? I would dispute that. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, so I, I, want, I want to open up another extremely controversial thing. Uh, dentists uh, think corporate dentistry is the 400-pound gorilla. They think that's uh, a real game changer. Do you, do you see corporate dentistry as part of a big game changer? In the, uh, I, mean, I mean, what I'm reading is there may be uh, – 35 chains that have 50 or more locations and they only are doing about 12 to 14% of the dentist is, is doing 12 to 14% uh, 
of the dentistry. Is that, is that a big game changer in your mind? Uh, it, it wasn't in my top five, as you recall. Right. Um, you know, I, you know, my take on that, whatever you want to call it, the, uh, it's big box dentistry or, you know, uh, move towards larger groups. It's a consolidation. Um, you know, to me, it's a slow, steady trend. I mean, I think a lot of this is driven by, uh, some, to some extent, by career preferences and work-life balance and, of younger dentists. Certainly not all of it. Uh, we know from surveys from Adia, et cetera, and other groups that young dentists still plan to own, right? Now, even, even if they're in um, a lot more of these kind of quote-unquote corporate models to begin their career. Um, owning a practice is still kind of the ultimate goal. But look, to me, this is just a, this is a reality. I do foresee that market share bumping up, Howard. I mean, you threw out some numbers in the low teens. We're trying to work on uh, assessing what share of dentists are in large groups. We're going to come out with something in the next few months on this. Uh, but it is roughly in that range, let's say 8 to 15 percent, something like that. Um, you know, and I see it as a slow, steady uptick. I don't think it's a big deal as an economist on the things that we research, right? So, for example, we looked at, we recently did a really extensive uh, career satisfaction survey where we compared solo dentists, dentists in small groups, and dentists in large groups on everything from your financial situation, your ability to have time off, your work-life balance, your autonomy, your clinical autonomy, interference in, in kind of the clinical practice of dentistry. And I mean, we did we found differences, but it wasn't clear cut. It wasn't like this model, dentists are unhappy, and in this model, they're really happy. It wasn't like that. I mean, you know, I think dentists sort based on their career preferences and you what they're- You should have done an entirely different study. You should have done one that figured out what percent of dentists are just batshit crazy. It would have <laughs> came in in at least the low 90s, okay? And I'm saying that as an incredibly batshit crazy dentist. Yeah, my, my homies are nuts. I want to ask you another question. Um, all the big corporate big boxes are reporting that two-thirds of their dentists are females. When I was a freshman in dental school, um, it was considered a male profession. There were just a dozen girls in the class, and that was a, and the senior class only had one, and our class had 12. Now, now half the graduating class is women. Uh, do, do you think changing from what was considered an all-male profession in the 70s to now half and half. Do you, do you, will that change anything from an uh, economist's point of view? Yeah, so let me share what our research has shown. And some of this is forthcoming, some is already published. Um, so we, we put out uh, a projection of the, the future supply of dentists. So we're able to look at retirement rates and new graduates and what we did is we adjusted basically for full-time equivalents, right? So females work a little bit less than male dentists. Female dentists on average work less than male dentists. So we adjusted for all the hours and everything. Is it just a little or is it significant? No, I mean, I don't, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's, I don't know, a couple hours a week, I think, yeah. a difference. Um, but, you know, big picture, Howard, the, the quote-unquote feminization of the workforce to me, does not change any of the big picture conclusions. We're on our way to a rising supply of dentists per capita, even adjusting for hours worked, right? Um, the, the second thing then is, well, do, are there implications for patients or dental practices, right? And, and the, the research we found that we published uh, last year in JADA was, you know, we did find things like females are less likely to be practice owners. Uh, they're more likely to go into certain specialties compared to males. Uh, they're more likely to accept Medicaid patients than their male counterparts. So again, the big picture implications on supply, I think we talk about that more than it's worth. Uh, but there are potential implications on, you know, ownership, and what specialties and whether you treat poor patients and even the level of invasiveness of dentistry. Uh, you know, there certainly are studies that confirm that after you control for other factors, there are some gender differences. Now, look, whether those are good or bad are not for me to judge, but they are there. Which, which um, special, uh, the nine specialties are they going into more? 
Uh, that I got to get back to. That one's not at my Be- Because one thing I've noticed is that, you know, when I was little, you know, all the gynecologists were men, and now they're all women. And you just almost never see a, a man gynecologist. And I, I haven't met a new graduate uh, male pediatric dentist in so long. And every time I'm at a school and I go to their pediatric dentistry class, it's it's all women. And I'm just sitting there thinking, God, if I was a mom and I had two kids and I had a chance between taking her to Jane or Joe, I would take her to Jane in a heartbeat. I, I, I think pediatric dentistry will be the first to go just like gynecology. Um, uh, you know, that that's my... Uh, based on just observation. Can't believe I only got you for five more minutes. I'm just, you'll know when the time's up because I'll start crying. Um, the other big, uh, huge change is income. It looks like I loved your chart. I've seen you uh, publish it several times where it looks like dentists, general dentist income peaked in 2005 and it's steadily been going down for a decade. Um, do you see that? Do you think that's going to continue to go down? Do you think that'll flatten? Do you think it'll eventually reverse? What, what's, what's your thoughts on dentist net income? Yeah, so I want to I want to raise two points. So number one is what what will happen, and and just to clarify, it hasn't been it's not a linear trend. So you mentioned right. so since, and we'll put the chart up. So since two thousand and five, there's been a decline, and then it's kind of been stable the past few years. Um, so it's not really rebounding. And the economy is, right? It's not really rebounding, uh, but at least it looks like the decline is kind of stopped. Um, so again, a, a big part of my predictions on where that income line will go rest with obviously as an economist, what's happening on the demand side and the supply side. So on the supply side, I've told you point blank, we're gonna see more dentists in the market. I mean, that to me is a very clear conclusion. And I'm talking adjusted for the size of the population. So more dentists per capita. Um, I've told you on the demand side, there are growth sectors. Again, my three are kids, seniors, and low-income adults. Um, That's typically not the kind of bread and butter population of a typical dental practice. We're talking more middle and upper income adult population where I don't see huge growth. So look, my, you know, we wrote about this in in pretty subtle language in that report, Howard, you know, I don't see a big rebound in the next few years unless something big changes in how that dentist income line will go. I mean, that's just my best guess given the available data. Now, it's not to say that something big can happen, but if we're in steady as she goes, I see that as a smooth line going forward. What I do, and this is my second point, what I want to clarify is, you know, that doesn't imply that dentistry isn't a great career. Again, I always tell dentists, you don't get to choose to be a dentist today versus in 2005, in 1980. That's not the choice, right? Young people can go into dentistry, medicine, acting, Wall Street, all that stuff, right? Those are your career choices. And it's it's unequivocal, the data and the research, and we, we published a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine. Right, of all places, where we compared kind of earnings and educational costs for a whole bunch of professions, and nothing that's happening in dentistry is unique to dentistry. I mean, we're seeing generally higher ed professional occupations. All of them are seeing somewhat of this earning stagnation, including physicians. And they're all seeing skyrocketing tuition and educational debt, right? So it's just kind of a fact of life of being a young professional today. You don't get to choose that 2016 against, again, 1980. It's what, what career do I take today? And we've seen all similar trends in law, dentistry, veterinary medicine, et cetera. So you're uh, saying if you, it's- to, if you go to the report, there's one occupation that is not seeing stagnating income relative to educational costs uh, and it's MBAs uh, but th- that's you know <laughs> yay <laughs> that was a uh, that was the biggest game changer I did for myself personally I did that 98 99 because they didn't teach you anything in dental school yeah. and I went in there for two years okay so I got you for 40 seconds left so I have to ask you one last question you got in 40 seconds I know you're the busiest man in dentistry uh, about dentists moving from state to state is that changing nowadays as as opposed to 10 years ago? Uh, we, we don't have hard data on that, but we just released kind of a really cool, neat study. Uh, if you go online at ada.org slash HPI, 
Um, we have a cool infographic that shows migration of dentists from one state to all others, and you could download the data. We have actually state-by-state -state flows, inflows, outflows. We definitely know young dentists are much more mobile than older dentists. Um, so um, I believe it was 16% of dentists under 40 move states within a five-year period. Um, and that, that's, that to me is pretty hot. Um, I do think that's going to increase just the way young people live. Um, and, you know, with whole dual career families and people wanting to be more mobile, uh, certainly has some implications for state practice um, recognition, uh, state licensure recognition, etc. cetera. Um, but, but it's really cool. I, go see those data. For some reason, North Dakota is a huge magnet. I mean, it on a fracking. percentage. I don't know what it is. It was I mean, fracking. We're, we're, we're looking into this. Certainly the, the oil boom is one component, but interestingly, I mean, this is something of interest to dentists. Uh, we correlated this with the percent of dentists participating in PPO plans. Um, and there's a pretty big correlation. Uh, it seems to be explaining this. I.e. North Dakota has one of the lowest PPO penetration rates. So they're, they're leaving uh, states high in PPO and going towards more fee for service like North Dakota and Alaska? Uh, that's what the data suggests. We're just kind of grinding What I suggest this. when I lecture in dental schools is that if they're going to make get married, make sure it's a really rich woman. <laughs> it was always good advice, right? Marry well. <laughs> no. Hey, I want to tell you, seriously, uh, how long have you been working at the ADA now? Five years now. Yeah, is, uh, and, and look, I do want to say I really... My big takeaway is that I don't want to, you know, I throw a lot of statistics around with curves maybe going in the wrong direction according to what dentists would prefer. To me, this is such a unique moment, and this is once in a generation, maybe once in a century, opportunities opening up for dentists. And again, if you're a dentist that is like, hey, I got into this gig because I just want to plug into my aunt's practice and do what they've been doing. I think that's misguided. I think if you're more entrepreneurial and innovative and want to collaborate and refer with physicians and different types of, of, of healthcare providers, are more interested in kind of keeping people healthy and not necessarily fascinated with all the procedures, um, I think those dentists are really going to see a, such an exciting time like never before. But it requires change, and that's always difficult, Howard. But and I also, want to say, I also want to say to my homies that uh, I've never missed an election. I figured that, uh, you know, over a million Americans have died for my right to vote. So even though I every time I've ever voted in my life, it's always like picking between do you want cancer or a heart attack or do you want your leg amputated above or below the knee? But this is why I'm a member of the ADA. And I know about a quarter of my homies, uh, they always find one complaint to justify why they're not a member of the ADA. And you know what's a cop out? You're the only group that recognizes us. I think of the 400 employees, I, I was stunned when they got you. I mean, I read your credentials and I just thought, holy shit, the ADA reached the big time. And uh, I think during these changing times, we need a very strong ADA. And I want to applaud the three out of four of my homies that pay the dues like I do. And the one in four quit taking a free ride because uh, people like Marco need more money to do what they do. Marco, I can't believe you spent an hour with me and my homies. Thank you so much for all that you do for dentistry. It was an honor and a privilege that you came on the show. My pleasure, Howard. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.